Uh, let's get more on all this with Jonathan Sloan. He's the chief executive officer at CLSA. He's here with an exclusive for an exclusive interview. Jonathan, great to see you. The growth story there that's, that's seemingly intact is the equity rally. Look, I think the equities have come very far very quickly. And obviously, when you have a big rally like that in a short period of time, you're going to get pullbacks. But I think on a secular basis, you are going to see a stronger China this year, both in uh, the underlying marketplace um, for equities. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of debt issuance. I think you're going to see a lot of rebalancing. As that rebalancing gets through, people will come, become more comfortable with marketplace again. Uh, indeed. And when we look at what's going on in the bond market, yes. a massive move there. And, yeah. uh, We've got Bill Gross saying yields above 2.4% represent perhaps a recession in the pipeline. And we're looking at what 2.5 plus on the handle there for the 10 year yield. Yeah. Um, and the yield on the S&P 500 is now less. Yes. Now, yeah. what, how, how does that all kind of get to get, how do you put the jigsaw together? Because some are saying, well, that does point to the end of this rally coming up. Well, look, I, I think that. It, there's no doubt that you're seeing inflationary pressures in the United States. Don't forget, you have a big tax cut coming at a time when you're at near full employment in the United States. Uh, you also have some cyclical factors in Europe. I mean, German economy is on fire, and the economy is very, very strong out here. That being said, I am not as afraid of tapering. I'm not as afraid of interest rate rises as some people are, simply because I think the marketplace is ready for them. And yes. I think people are going to be a little bit surprised on the upside in terms of where interest rates are going to go because we have a mentality that interest rates never rise. They only go down. And when they go up a little bit, everybody gets scared and they go back down again. You might not have that, that happen this time, but you have a lot of asset deflation to deflate in some areas like Bitcoin, um, other types of assets which have gone way beyond where they should be right now. In terms of equity markets, you still have growth in earnings, so I'm not that worried about equity itself. Yeah, you know, there are still analysts that say, like, at the end of the day, that the central bank put is always still going to be there, at least that's how a lot of market participants are feeling at the moment. But mm. you, you say these are the things that you're not afraid of. Jonathan, what are you afraid of? What are the risks for you? Well, obviously, I'm afraid of political risk. Uh, you have somebody in the White House who's a bit volatile. Um, you have a situation in Europe which is, you know, really unclear where Merkel's going to be. Um, so I think political risk is out there. I think in terms of the underlying economics of the global economy right now, uh, we're doing okay. That being said, if you do see, um, you know, inflation not take off, if you do see a situation where bonds start um, um, coming back again and interest rates come off again, you're going to see a lot of this asset deflation back. And asset deflation uh, going too fast, too quickly does worry me. What about China? Does this sort of rebalancing that's struggling to take place there is obviously prioritized by Beijing, but we know that, you know, this could be yeah. a, a pretty painful process. Does that worry you in no. terms of being a global drag on growth? Look, I, I think that um, for many years, everybody has relied on the Chinese economy bailing everybody out. And that simply doesn't need to be the case anymore. Um, Japan, you're seeing better economic growth. You're seeing better economic growth in Europe. You're seeing solid economic growth in the United States. You have this tax cut coming in. And yeah, I think that as China um, restructures uh, certain industries uh, and rebalances the economy, you're going to see a slowdown. They've told us this. This is nothing that we don't already know. This should already be factored in the market. This should already be factored into prices. It's not like they're coming out and saying for the first time ever, oh, you know, we're going to deal with slower growth now because we need to rebalance the economy. We've had two years of this talk. We're talking about overall markets. Where's it all going, et cetera, et cetera. And you're saying people are underplaying the risks to interest rates. In fact, the interest rates could go higher, yeah. which naturally begs the question, do you see inflation then going much higher and are people being too complacent about that? You know, I don't think you're going to see a lot of consumer price inflation in terms of manufactured goods. Um, I think China is going to keep a cap on that. I do think you're going to see inflation in, in services, and I do think you're going to see asset inflation. Um, so as you get to full employment... So you won't show up in CPI is what you're suggesting? That, that's correct. I mean, and again, you know, you have to remember that when Greenspan, you know, looked back on his so-called mistake, uh, it was that he didn't uh, factor in asset inflation during a period of time when you had a CPI coming down. So I think that, you know, people need to consider the fact that not only are asset prices rising rather rapidly, you have these mini bubbles like Bitcoin, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, but the fact is, equity prices are quite high.
That's just it. If you even look at what's going on in Hong Kong, it looks cheap. But do you yeah. take out some of the ten cents of this world and suddenly uh, you, uh, or you take the bank side, I should say, right. then it suddenly goes up quite a lot, doesn't it? Right. Although I can make the argument, I mean, look at the property stocks. Huge discounts to NAV. Um, some of the biggest that we've seen in a very, very long time. Uh, you can also look at, okay, you want to discount internet, but internet's growing rapidly. I mean, look at the growth rate of Tencent or Alibaba or something like Auto Home, for example. Um, you know, these companies are growing rather rapidly. So I think there's value in some parts of the marketplace. Um, I just think, think there's overall value. And I do think that, uh, I think, again, markets will be higher at the end of next year than they are right now, in my opinion. But I think it's going to be a little volatile getting there. Yeah, Jonathan, talk to me about volatility, whether that's going to be a change from what we saw last year of extraordinarily low volatility, right, mm -hmm. even at points where we had, you know, what felt like inflection points when it comes to geopolitical worries. 7470 is a chart that I want to show, which may be portends that we're getting at more volatility, uh, or at least at the market, certain parts of the market are betting on it, even though the VIX is still pretty close to record lows. The relative cost of betting on an increase in volatility has been surging compared to wages uh, on a decline in volatility. So what do you think this year holds and are we going to see a turnaround for vol? Hmm. Yeah, in, in a period of time when you have interest rates at just such a low level and liquidity at such a high level, uh, the tendency is that you don't get a lot of volatility. I think as this adjustment period comes in, as then the bond market settle down into what could be a new trading range, I do think you'll see that volatility come back. I think volatility is good for markets. You want to see buyers and sellers. Uh, you want to see the market making prices in a much more natural way than just a one-way direction. So I think all of this is good um, for a marketplace, and I do think you will see more volatility. Um, Mifford, how's that sort of worked out for you guys? It sort of, you know, st started with, the, with not too much in the way of volatility or in the way of, uh, of anything extreme in terms of market movements, but it's kind of yet to play out, no? Yeah, look, Mifid actually has been a good thing in so far as we get to sit down with our clients and really talk through what our relationship is, how we have to deal with each other in a new way, and what the new paradigm is uh, to where regulators want it to go. That being said, I do think it's been a, let's put it this way, interesting experiment thus far. Uh, I think that the FCA uh, has not been as ready as they thought. I think that the buy side and the sell side all have had to make adjustments, and everybody's taking it as it goes. As of now, for CLSA itself, uh, we've seen market share increases in all of our markets, particularly in the European market where MIFID is hit. That being said, you are seeing lower commission rates. Is the old school broking model done and dusted now? And how does it evolve? That's the point. And how does your business evolve? Do you go more into, as other people have been, looking at asset management? Well, look, we've obviously changed our uh, business model quite a bit, and we've had to update it for where the marketplace has taken us. You know, we have to go where our clients are going, and our clients are going in a lot of different directions than they were, say, 20 years ago. So, yes, there's no doubt that we've had to change um, what we do. That being said, everything that we do is focused in on our own proprietary information, the research that we bring to the table, the capabilities that we bring to our table, being a broker in Asia that is on the ground everywhere we operate. Um, and that is going to stay the same. And the so, money's coming in, that's the and thing. And the money's coming in. Yes, I mean, there has been an unbelievable move of money. Um, it is coming, you know, people ask me where it's coming from. It's coming from robo-advisors, it's becoming from black boxes, it's coming from long-term capital, short-term movements. Uh, we're basically seeing people really reevaluate uh, Asia in a new and fundamental way and understanding that the growth is going to be here and the value is here and we're seeing money from almost every sector coming in. What's your biggest contrarian view then for this year, Jonathan? Ah, what's my biggest contrarian view? Um, probably that Bitcoin goes even higher. Um, you know, I don't think that central <laughs> banks are ready to take out that much uh, liquidity. Hang on, and you I do just said it was going down because of all these assets. No, I think, I think it's definitely going down in the near term. So I, I, I've been telling people, it, you know, we're going under 1,200. We're probably going under 1,000. I mean, we could see real um, uh, capitulation of a lot of players that were in Bitcoin just for speculative purposes. Um, but I do think that um, at the end of the day, central banks are going to want to keep asset prices at a certain level, which I think is problematic.